Hello everyone, my name is Stu Adler. Welcome back to Introductory Lectures in Thermodynamics. In the last episode, we took an introductory look at how workers describe the equilibrium state properties of single component fluids, in particular relationships among pressure, temperature, molar volume, and enthalpy. We also went through some examples where we combined this thermodynamic information with basic conservation principles to solve for amounts of certain phases or other extensive quantities. In today's episode, I'd like to show you how some of these same basic ideas can be extended to systems with two or more distinct molecular species, also known as components. To begin, when more than one species is present, we need to expand our list of properties to include composition of the mixture. There are many variables used to describe composition. In chemistry, for example, we often describe a solution in terms of the concentrations in moles per liter of the various species in a solvent. However, in chemical engineering, we often deal with mixtures that don't have a clear majority solvent. Also, we usually need composition variables that work well with the framework of mass or molar balances. For this reason, we often describe composition in terms of mass or mole fractions. The mole fraction, x sub i, is defined as the number of moles of a particular species, i, divided by the total number of moles of all species present. For a single phase mixture, mole fraction is phase intensive, representing a spatially uniform average fraction of the molecules that are species I. However, if a system contains more than one phase, mole fraction is system intensive, representing a global average among all phases present, just like molar volume or enthalpy, which we treated previously. For a binary mixture of two species A and B, we can define two mole fractions, XA and XB. However, these two fractions must always sum to one, meaning they are not independent. Thus, there really is only one composition variable needed to define the composition of a binary mixture. Speaking more generally, if we have capital N species present in our system, we'll need N minus one composition variables to fully define composition. Another common choice for describing composition is mass fraction, x sub i with a caret over it, defined as the mass of species i divided by the total mass. For simple molecules of known structure, the choice of mass or mole fraction is largely a matter of convenience, since one can always relate one to the other by knowing the molecular weights. However, for systems comprising large and or ill-defined molecules like polymers, it's common to use mass fraction exclusively. Okay, so what happens to the number of degrees of freedom of a phase if we have more than one component? According to Gibbs phase rule, F equals two plus C minus P. Thus, for every additional component we add, we add one additional degree of freedom. But for each component we add, we also add one composition variable. This means that if we fully define the composition of our phase, we are left with two additional intensive variables, such as temperature and pressure, to fully define the intensive thermodynamic state. This aligns nicely with our previous understanding, based on the state postulate, of how many intensive properties are needed to define the state of the phase after specifying what molecules are present. Gibbs phase rules telling us we need to define both the identity and relative numbers of each type of molecule if we have a mixture. To see this all played out, let's take a look at an example from a book by Duncan and Reimer, who examine what happens during flash separation of a binary mixture of benzene and toluene. In this process, 100 moles per minute of liquid containing a 50-50 mixture of benzene and toluene at one atmosphere is expanded isothermally through a valve at 80 degrees C to a lower pressure. The mixture enters a flash drum where it partially vaporizes and separates by gravity into gas and liquid, which leave the drum via separate streams at steady state. Based on the boiling points of pure benzene and toluene, we can see that the mixture entering the process is just below the normal boiling point of benzene, while it's almost 30 degrees C below the boiling point of toluene. Thus, we might expect intuitively that the gas exiting the drum will be richer in benzene than the original mixture, while the liquid will be richer in toluene. 
but will the separation of benzene and toluene be complete or just partial? And if partial, what determines how good a separation we can obtain? As an example, imagine we want to produce a gas which is 75 mole percent benzene. What pressure do we need in the flash drum? What will the composition of the liquid be? And what flow rates will we have in the exit streams? Before looking at any equilibrium data, let's first think about how this data might be represented. With two components and one phase, Gibbs phase rule predicts three degrees of freedom. Thus, if we specify temperature and pressure and the mole fraction of benzene, all other properties such as volume, enthalpy, and so forth are determined by equilibrium. But to draw any of these relationships, we would need to plot values along two-dimensional contours within a continuous three-dimensional space. Although you can find a few textbooks around that have tried to do this, it's very hard to visualize this way and seldom done in practice. Instead, let's fix one of the variables. For example, let T equals a particular temperature, T0. Our job then becomes limited to describing how independent variables like V and H, or the number and types of various phases, depend on P and XB. These are relationships we can represent as 1D contours on a two-dimensional plot, just like single component phase diagrams we've seen. In particular, at a temperature of 80 degrees C, as we vary composition from pure toluene to pure benzene, and vary pressure up to our starting pressure of one atmosphere, what phases will be present in our system, and what will their properties be? Unfortunately, it's not safe to put mixtures of benzene and toluene into a glass piston cylinder assembly we used previously to study properties of H2O. Instead, let's walk through a thought experiment about what we would see based on known equilibrium data. To start, imagine we just had pure liquid benzene at 80 degrees C and measured the pressure as a function of volume as we expand the piston, much like we did with H2O. What would happen? At first, as we saw with water, we'd observe sharp changes in pressure with tiny changes in volume due to the near incompressibility of liquid benzene. This is consistent with the two degrees of freedom we have for a pure component as a single phase liquid. However, as we continue to expand the piston, we'd eventually reach the saturation pressure of the benzene, which at 80 degrees C is near one atmosphere. At this point, we would only have one degree of freedom, and thus as we continued to expand the system, the pressure would remain fixed at the saturation pressure as long as two phases are present. Indeed, assuming our imaginary piston is very long, we could continue expanding the system at a constant saturation pressure of one atmosphere until nearly all the liquid is converted to gas. Finally, at a volume of about 2.9 cubic meter per mole, the last bit of liquid would evaporate. At volumes larger than this, the system would contain all gas, returning the system to two degrees of freedom, and the pressure would vary inversely with volume as predicted by the ideal gas law. Returning to the axes of our phase diagram, we can summarize these results by placing data points indicating the presence of liquid or gas in our system at a given pressure and composition. In this case, all the data points sit on the vertical axis at xb equals 1, corresponding to pure benzene. As we lower the pressure, the system remains a liquid until p equals 1 atmosphere, at which point it splits into two phases. It remains this way until the pressure drops below one atmosphere, at which point we only observe a gas. Repeating this experiment for pure toluene, we expect very similar results. However, the saturation pressure of toluene is only 0.4 bar at 80 degrees C. Thus, the same transition we saw for benzene would occur at a lower pressure. But what would happen with a 50-50 mixture of benzene and toluene? Although the overall composition of the system would be fixed inside our piston cylinder assembly, the composition of individual phases might differ. Thus, in addition to pressure, let's imagine measuring the composition and amount of both phases as the system volume is expanded. Starting with the liquid, we would see the same thing as the pure liquids. Infinitesimal changes in volume would introduce measurable changes in pressure. This is consistent with Gibbs phase rule, which predicts three degrees of freedom. Thus, having already specified T equals 80 C and XB equals 0.5, we 
we are still free to vary molar volume independently and monitor changes in pressure as a dependent variable. However, upon reaching a pressure of 0.69 atmospheres, we would see the first bubbles form. This is known as the bubble point. As long as these bubbles are small, the composition of the liquid, which is still most of the system, would still be about 50% benzene. But due to the higher volatility of the benzene, the gas would be enriched with a mole fraction of Xb equals 0.83. Continuing to expand the volume into a very large cylinder, we would find that, unlike a pure component, the pressure would continue to decrease. Why is this? Well, unlike a pure component, the composition of the liquid and gas are not fixed as the volume expands. Due to the higher volatility of the benzene, the mole fraction of benzene is higher in the gas. Thus, as more gas forms, it selectively removes benzene from the liquid. This causes the remaining liquid to become more concentrated in toluene. As the concentration of the less volatile toluene increases, the saturation pressure of the mixture decreases. Meanwhile, the benzene concentration in the gas also decreases. These trends can be nicely understood in terms of Gibbs phase rule, which, with two phases present, predicts two degrees of freedom. We fix temperature at 80 C, but what's the other independent variable? Since there are two phases, we can no longer treat volume as phase intensive. However, if we choose Xb of the liquid as the other phase intensive variable, we see in the data that pressure and mole fraction of benzene in the gas are determined by equilibrium, as expected. At a temperature of 0.47 atmospheres, all but the last bit of liquid would evaporate, corresponding to the dew point of the mixture at 80 degrees C. At this point, the gas, which constitutes most of the molecules in the system, would have a composition of Xb equals 0.5, while the liquid would have a much lower benzene concentration due to the higher volatility of the benzene. Finally, at the pressures below this, the system would be all gas with a fixed benzene mole fraction of 0.5, and a pressure that varies inversely with volume according to the ideal gas law corresponding to three degrees of freedom with T, X, B, and V as independent phase intensive variables. Returning to our growing phase diagram again, the data I just showed you looks something like this. Above a pressure of 0.69 atmospheres, we have a single phase liquid with fixed independent composition X, B equals 0.5. Between 0.69 and 0.47 atmospheres, the system splits into two phases both with compositions determined by equilibrium at the chosen pressure, consistent with our loss of one degree of freedom. Finally, below 0.47 atmospheres, we have a single phase gas with fixed independent composition, Xb equals 0.5 again. Repeating this experiment at other system compositions, for example, Xb equals 0.25 and Xb equals 0.75, we would see something like this. As you can see, a pattern is beginning to emerge showing a region of the pressure composition space where the system is not stable as a single phase. Putting this all together, we get a type of phase diagram called a PX diagram, showing regions of pressure and composition where the system is stable as liquid or gas, and a two-phase region where the system will split into a gas with higher benzene concentration and a liquid with lower benzene concentration. At any given pressure, we can draw a tie line the ends of which correspond to the mole fractions of benzene in the gas and liquid at equilibrium at that pressure and 80 degrees C. Points along this tie line correspond to the overall system intensive composition of the mixture. This overall composition depends on the relative amounts of the gas and liquid, just as we saw for molar volume or enthalpy when only a single component was present. Returning to our flash separation, Let's try to use this phase diagram to figure out the required pressure and composition of liquid needed to achieve 75% purity of benzene in the gas stream. According to our PX diagram, gas with 75% benzene can exist in stable equilibrium with a liquid having a 38% benzene concentration at a pressure of 0.62 atmospheres. Thus, if we start at one atmosphere, an ADC, with a liquid having 50% benzene, and isothermally drop the pressure to 0.62 atmospheres, the liquid will split into a gas and liquid with compositions given by the tie line. 
how much gas and liquid will we produce at these compositions? Labeling streams, we can write balances for the total moles entering and exiting the flash drum, as well as the moles of benzene, which can be expressed as an intensive mole fraction times the molar flow in each stream. This yields a system with two equations and two unknowns, n.2 and n.3. Solving and putting in equilibrium mole fractions from the phase diagram, we find that 32% of the incoming mixture will leave as a gas containing 75% benzene, while 68% will leave as a liquid containing 38% benzene. Another way to think about this same problem is to express the overall mole fraction of a mixture in the drum in terms of the quality, Q, of the mixture, defined as the fraction of total moles which are gas. Just like any other system intensive property, such as molar volume or enthalpy, we can express the mole fraction of benzene in the system as a quality weighted average of the benzene mole fractions in the individual phases. At steady state, the quality of the mixture in the drum relates directly to the ratio of the gas flow in stream 2 to the incoming flow in stream 1. Rearranging and solving for Q in terms of the mole fractions in the drum and in both individual phases, we obtain the same result as from our molar balance. Before moving on, please note the distinction in our analysis between a mole fraction in this problem XB, which is the fraction of a phase or system that is a particular component, versus a phase fraction, in this problem the quality Q, which is the fraction of total moles in the system that are in a particular phase. This is another common pitfall for students in thermodynamics, one that can be avoided by reminding yourself what the numerator and denominator are for the quote fraction unquote being considered. So to take things a bit further, let's say that 75% purity of benzene is not quite good enough. We'd really like the benzene gas we produce to be 90% pure. Can we achieve this with the current process? According to the phase diagram, a gas with Xb equals 0.90 can exist in equilibrium with a liquid with Xb equals 0.63 at 0.78 atmospheres. But what happens if we actually try to do this separation? Our original liquid falls outside the composition range of the tie line. Thus, if we start with a liquid that has 50% benzene and drop the pressure to 0.78 atmospheres, the system will just stay in the liquid phase region, producing all liquid with 50% benzene at 0.78 atmospheres and no gas. In fact, examining the phase diagram, we can see that for a starting composition of 50% benzene, we can only get phase separation between 0.7 and 0.48 atmospheres, corresponding to maximum and minimum benzene concentrations of 0.83 in the gas or 0.12 in the liquid. Basically, these two compounds are too similar in volatility to achieve higher purity of benzene or toluene with a single flash. So what can we do about this? One idea would be to do some kind of multi-stage separation. Going back to our original process with 75% pure gas, what if we now take that gas and recompress it isothermally, sending it to a second drum for separation into a gas and a liquid? According to the phase diagram, if we start at 75% benzene and compress to 0.78 atmospheres, this falls in an appropriate composition range to obtain a gas with 90% benzene and a second liquid stream with 63% benzene. Not wanting to waste this liquid, let's feed it back to the first stage, allowing it to reseparate at the lower pressure of 0.62 atmospheres. The net result looks like this. We end up with two product streams, our original liquid with 38% benzene and a new gas stream with 90% benzene. What will the flow rate in the two product streams be in this revised configuration? Placing a control volume around the entire process and labeling the inlet and outlet streams, we can again formulate extensive conservation statements for the total moles and moles of benzene. Solving algebraically and substituting composition values for the three streams, we find a gas flow of 23 moles per minute, lower than what we had at lower purity. This is because we're still wasting a lot of benzene, which leaves at fairly high concentration in the liquid coproduct. 
Note that in this case, there's no easy way to recast the fraction of gas produced in terms of quality. This is because the gas produced is a product of both stages working together, and thus does not correspond to the quality of the mixture in either drum individually. This is why it's so important, as you work through these problems, to always recognize the inherent role of mass and energy conservation in determining the amounts of phases in equilibrium in a system, even when using quality as an intermediary. Returning to our process, can we do even better by adding more stages? The answer is yes, but generally speaking, compressors are expensive. Instead of operating stages at different pressures, can we instead operate them at different temperatures? One way to analyze this would be to repeat our piston cylinder thought experiment at other temperatures besides 80 degrees C and add them to our PX diagram. For example, the normal boiling point of toluene is 111 degrees C. Redrawing the phase diagram at this temperature shifts the entire two-phase region upward such that the equilibrium between pure toluene gas and pure liquid sits at one atmosphere, just as it did for benzene at 80 degrees C. We can likewise fill in the two-phase region at other temperatures between these two extremes. If we now fix pressure at one atmosphere, we can see that we'll get a family of tie lines corresponding to different temperatures between 80 degrees and 111 C. If we forget about the other pressures and instead fix pressure at one atmosphere, and then expand temperature along the vertical axis, we get what looks like a two-phase region. Indeed, filling in the other temperatures, we produce what is called a TX diagram, probably the most common format for phase diagrams in the chemical sciences. In this case, the diagram nicely maps out combinations of temperature and composition at one atmosphere where the system is stable as a single phase gas or liquid and the two phase region where it is unstable and thus splits into liquid and gas at equilibrium. The form of this diagram suggests that another way to purify a 50% mixture of benzene and toluene is to keep the pressure constant but add heat until the mixture partially boils corresponding to equilibrium within the two-phase region. For example, according to our data, if we raise the temperature to 95 degrees C and allow the system to reach equilibrium, we will produce a gas with 79% benzene and a liquid with 41% benzene. This is fairly lackluster separation. However, if we now partially condense the gas from the first heating stage by removing heat, allowing it to reestablish equilibrium at a second stage at 87 degrees C, it will produce an even purer gas with 90% benzene. Likewise, if we take the liquid from the first stage and reheat it to 104 degrees C, we will produce a liquid with 15% benzene. Recycling the less pure streams to the first stage, we are now producing benzene-rich and toluene-rich product streams with higher purities than we can achieve with one stage acting alone. Adding additional stages at 82.5 and 109 C, and then another two stages at 81 degrees C and 110.5 degrees C, we obtain a process with seven total stages that produces 99% pure benzene and 99% pure toluene, 50 moles each. Since this process runs at one atmosphere, no compressors or other moving parts are required. Furthermore, if we're clever about our choice of temperatures and compositions, heat liberated by condensing the upward flowing gases entering each stage can be used to boil the downward flowing liquid. In this case, only two heaters and one condenser are needed to run the entire process. This, in a nutshell, is how a multi-stage distillation column works. That's as far as I plan to take this example. However, the question of heat loads on each stage in our process leads to a broader question of how to analyze heat and work in systems with more than one component. For single component systems, we saw that one way to represent the relationship of enthalpy to other variables is with a pH diagram. Is there an equivalent type of diagram for enthalpy versus composition at fixed pressure? The answer is yes and no. The relationship of enthalpy to composition is something we will spend a lot of time modeling in Chem E326. These models are usually mathematical rather than graphical in nature. However, before the proliferation of computers, chemical engineers came up with all kinds of clever ways to analyze problems graphically. 
In the interest of deeper understanding, let's take a look at one such diagram, the HX diagram. Shown here is an HX diagram for ethanol water mixtures. Here the pressure is fixed at one atmosphere, and the independent variables of the diagram are the mass-specific enthalpy, H hat, and the weight fraction of ethanol, XA hat, where A stands for alcohol. Also plotted are isothermal contours in the single phase liquid region at the bottom of the chart and isothermal tie lines in the two phase region. Note that the tie lines in this case are not vertical or horizontal. This is because neither of the principal axes of the plot are temperature or pressure, which we expect to be shared among phases at equilibrium. In general, the gas and liquid will have different mass specific enthalpies and alcohol weight fractions. On the other hand, the tie lines do appear to follow straight lines. Why is this? Well, recall that the, in the two-phase region, any mass-specific property of the system will be a linear function of the mass-specific quality, defined as the fraction of the system mass that is gas. Since both enthalpy and weight fraction vary linearly with Q, they must also vary linearly with each other, with a slope given by the ratio of the difference in enthalpy between the gas and liquid to the difference in weight fraction of alcohol between the gas and liquid. As an example of a problem where an HX diagram might be useful, imagine we feed a liquid mixture of 20 weight percent ethanol in water at 20 degrees C in one atmosphere to a boiler, hoping to produce a gas with 50 weight percent ethanol. What is the appropriate equilibrium temperature in the boiler? How much heat do we need to add to get this to the correct temperature? And what will the compositions and relative amounts of gas and liquid be that are produced? Examining the tie lines provided on the diagram, we can see that a 50 weight percent ethanol gas can exist in stable equilibrium with a liquid containing 7 percent ethanol at 93 degrees C. We also know the mixture entering the boiler contains 20 weight percent ethanol. Thus, we can work out using a total mass balance and a mass balance on ethanol what the ratio of the gas mass flow to the inlet flow must be. Putting in weight fractions from the diagram, we find that the gas exiting the boiler will be 30% of the incoming mass. So for example, if we wanted to produce one kilogram per second of 50% ethanol, we would need about 3.3 kilograms per second in stream one. Meanwhile, how much heat, Q dot, will this require? Applying an energy balance, we find that the ratio of heat flow to the incoming mass flow is given by the difference in mass specific enthalpy between stream one and the quality weighted average of the gas and liquid exiting the system in streams two and three. Putting in numbers again, we get 190 kcals per kilogram, which is about 630 kcals per second for an incoming flow rate of 3.3 kilograms per second. This heat requirement can be visualized on the HX diagram as the difference between the enthalpy of the final mixture along the tie line at 200 kcals per kilogram and the enthalpy of the initial mixture at 20 C, which is about 10 kcals per kilogram. Back in the 1960s, chemical engineers worked out the mass and energy balances of distillation columns with charts just like this one. Although workers often use computers for the same calculations today, they are still useful conceptually for understanding what's going on in a system before punching numbers into Aspen.